Tucked up against the bustling I-90 outside of Syracuse, New York, with the glitz of Turning Stone Resort Casino looming on the horizon, sits a little town of just over 4,000 people. The thruway junction lets you off to an open intersection featuring a McDonald's, two abandoned hotels, a native-owned gas station, a uh, native-owned gas station and slot parlor, Ooh. the International Boxing Hall of Fame, and a terribly aged Italian restaurant made to look like a castle la la Monty Python for whatever reason. Wait, International Boxing Hall of Fame? Huh? Hmm. I'm Zach. And I'm Matt. And this is the Your Town Podcast. <laughs> All right, so this was going to be the part where Zach was going to go, hey, and start to get in the episode. But I want—I had a little bit of some news. Like, as you can hear and potentially see, Zach's back. He, he's got his gas figured out, which wasn't yep. an actual farting thing. Like, he, he's legit back. Yep. Yep. And, you know, life gets busy. So shout out not only to Zach making it back, but Meg for kind of filling in. on. Uh, Thank I you, said Meg. some big shoes to fill, but I was like, his shoes really aren't that big. He's not, like, super yeah, tall, not that I am. But either way... Welcome back. Super excited about this one. This is one that we've really been, you know, uh, talking about, you know, when every time we've kind of hung out, this is a really cool one and uh, I'm excited to jump into it. So I had to get that out, but now it's back to you. Let's do it. Let's do it so, back. so why the hell is the international boxing hall of fame literally across the street from one of the worst McDonald's I've ever had the displeasure of ordering a 20 piece medium fry and diet Coke from? <laughs> Do tell. Because the town in question, Canastota, New York, a place that I habitated in for about uh, two years, is the hometown of Carmen Basilio, the upstate onion farmer. He was one yeah. of the Ring Magazine's top 50 fighters of the last 100 years. And we're talking uh, pugilistic boxing here, as in line with the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Uh, they're to, well, top 50 fighters of the last 100 years, and he was once simultaneously a two-weight champion, two champion of the world. He was a three-time fighter of the year and five-time participant in fight of the year. And that was five years in a row. Wow. That's, that's pretty impressive. And for people that don't really watch boxing, because there's probably a lot of people that are like, what the hell is boxing? I mean, can you, uh, being a fan that loves you know the fights, whether it's boxing, MMA, whatever, can you think of anybody off the top of your head that has done what he did for five years? Uh, probably. I don't even think Tyson would have been because I, I think Tyson was a little bit sharper trajectory up and down. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe if we crunch the numbers like Canelo Alvarez right now in boxing would probably be that way. Um, man, but I'm really thinking the only person that would come close to that would be John Jones back in his light heavyweight run with the UFC or uh, uh, Patricio Pitbull Fury in Bellator. Yeah. Um, and John Jones, probably the closest to it though, with his run through uh, run through the light heavyweight division. I mean, then that's 19, what, 30 or probably forties, the 1940s until present day. I mean, what, eight, almost 80 something years. Yeah. And we can barely come up with uh, not even a handful of fighters that have done what he would. just to kind of put things in perspective, not to go off tangent, but that's, that's, a, that's really good for people that don't understand boxing. Yeah. I mean, and this was also back in a time when sanctioning bodies weren't, well, this is back before the federal government stepped in to regulate boxing. Yeah. And because boxing was so dirty and corrupt and awful that the federal government, it hadn't happened before and it still hasn't happened since, stepped in. It was like, you guys need to chill out. Like people are dying. Fights are getting thrown. People were funneling mafia money through boxing gambling rings. Like it was bad. But this was all before the government stepped in and was like, you guys got to check yourself. So he did this. Like, And we'll get into it a little bit later on. But, I mean, we got Basilio fighting 20, 30 rounds in, in, in less than a month. Like, that's, that's 
unheard yeah. of let alone that yeah. but and it kind of reminds me of when we did season one episode six little callback ty cobb when we when we started doing that not only the gambling and the kind of crookedness mm-hmm. in that sport but just how it was a different you know sport and we continue yeah. to say how it was a different time to be alive back then for several reasons and you're going to see some of those reasons coming up from what zach has to say too so absolutely um, and I mean, and, and we'll get now get into this a little bit later on, but also remember the name Billy Backus. Billy Backus is going to come back into play here too. Uh, boxing guys will know Billy Backus, but we'll get into it for the general population here in a little bit. Yeah. Um, regardless, it is hard to believe, but a man once considered one of the world's pound for pound greatest fighters of all time was born and raised in this quiet little town of Canastota in central New York, but he was. In fact, I lived one block, one street over from the street that he grew up on. Oh. Um, and it's it's considered a New York State historic site, but it's a rental property. Like you can you can just get a one year lease on Carmen Basilio's house, and you can just live there. Really? Which is yeah, I especially with it being the like in boxing is big there, which is weird that there's not a gym, but. Yeah. That was confusing me when I moved there. But, yeah, like, boxing is big. Carmen Basilio is huge. His house is a rental property. It's not a museum. It's, yeah. It's, it's a good, not yeah, that's... lived in by his wife. It's it's a rental property. But anyway. And real um, quick, too, just to, before, not to cut you off, but maybe. if you are a real big sports fan, Canastota, go check out, you know, as mentioned, the, the Boxing Hall of Fame. Drive an hour in like 10 minutes, I'd have to guess. You're in Cooperstown, New York. Check out the Baseball Hall of Fame. So, yep. New York, you can do, Central. Um, you, can do, you can do Cooper's or you can do Canastota in the afternoon and then drive to Cooperstown, get the Hall of Fame, get the Baseball Hall of Fame, and then get dinner and drinks. And the hotels are wicked cheap in Cooperstown. Airbnbs are super cheap out there. Yeah. If you're a sports guy, awesome. that's – yeah, you can really have a fun day. Yep, and you're going to have a fun day because you're going to listen to the rest of this. Zach's got some really good stuff, so uh, do the thing. Keep going. Yeah, My so throw it, throw it all the way back to get full context here. Born April 2nd, 1927, Basilio was one of 10 children born to Italian immigrants right in Canastota, New York. The oh, town's shit. low ten? marshes. 10. Yeah, Whew. 10. Wow. Uh, the town's low, marshy, swamp-like land makes the area ideal for onion cultivation. A business where Basilio's father made the family money and where Carmen went on to derive his fight name, the Upstate Onion Farmer. Seemingly uninterested in academia, which also plays in later on, Carmen dropped out of high school with full intention to become a prize fighter. He wet his feet by boxing for the U.S. Marine Corps during World War II, was discharged and made his professional debut in 1948. No, I do not believe he saw combat. I think he shielded shield himself from combat by being a boxer. Yep. That is wild. Like, I mean, obviously, again, different times. So it just dropped out of school and was like, you know what? I got this. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of people that are like, I'm going to be a professional of this. So this, like, at that point, like, he didn't have much. I mean, maybe he had a fallback plan. He could have just kept cultivating onions. But yeah, he could have just out, onions. Turns out he made a lot of other people cry and tear up in a much different way than the onions. Yeah. So and what I find really cool and very your town about Basilio is that he stayed local for a long part for the most of his career, especially the first couple of years of his career. So mm-hmm. he kicked off his professional career, uh, as I put, with speed and tenacity, which is not even legal anymore by any state's commission or any international commission standards. Between November 24th and December 15th of 1948, the upstate onion farmer won four straight bouts, wow. needing only 12 total rounds to do so. His Ooh, first three fights. What's that? I said for anybody three. good at math, that's three. Wow. Okay. Sorry. So, his, so his first three fights, two of which took place in Binghamton, New York, and the other two took place in Syracuse, New York, were one via knockout in the thirds, first, and sixth rounds, respectively, and those were all 10-round contests. Wow. Well, and then the other amazing. one was by a referee scorecard. That is not that many days. I was trying to do the math real quick. That's a couple of weeks for four yeah. fights, 12 rounds. I mean, now you have people that have a, a 10 or 12 round bout and how many months off do they take between or years? That's so depending, depending on the commission and boxing is a little bit different because of how it's set up, 
But mm-hmm. typically, if you go the distance in a fight or you're the victim of a knockout, you're looking at a minimum of six to 10 month mandatory medical suspension from the commission that you're fighting under. So you can do things to get that suspension brought down. Cause obviously if you're a prize fighter, you're not making money. If you're not fighting Mm -hmm. then you win your purses, but there's fees and everything that get paid out. So you can do things to to whittle that down. But this obviously wasn't an issue. I mean, Carmen probably didn't even wash his shorts. He just threw them in the back of the truck and let's go. We got to go to Binghamton. I mean, it sounds like it because that was December 5th of 1948, and then you're about to tell us how he kicked off 49. Yeah. So, yeah, so he kicks off his 1949 campaign by booking himself twice in two weeks. Fought a Friday, off a Friday, fought a Friday. Crazy. It was here, however, that Carmen ran into his first setback. He dropped both bouts in six rounds via referee scorecard. Uh, from there, though, Carmen finished his 15-fight campaign that year. <laughs> He lost his first two fights in that time. He lost his first two fights. So he fought to two draws, and then he lost two fights, one via referee scorecard and the other via split decision. But overall, the upstate onion farmer went into 1950 with an impressive record of 15-2-2 with eight knockouts. Boy, 19 fights in 1950. That's, that's, That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, it was also during this 1950 campaign that Carmen struck gold for the first time by beating former The Ring lightweight champion Lou Jenkins by majority decision in a 10-round bout at the State Fair Coliseum in Syracuse, March 6th. That's awesome. So, point of clarity, because I had to look this up. Uh, so, I'm going to I'm going to mention referee scorecard and then split and unanimous decisions in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, all you need to know for you guys that aren't boxing nerds is. Referee scorecard, uh, this is still big in the UK, not really big in the, in the US anymore, but it was back at this time. Um, for, for lesser profile fights like Carmen was at this time, they didn't even bother paying judges. The referee had to referee the fight and score the fight. Yikes. Wow, yeah. there was definitely some crooked, shady stuff. Going y- on. Yeah, so you can probably yeah. see where there was time for some bad shit to happen. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so, and if I refer, if, so if I say, Referee scorecard, uh, his official record puts it as a points defeat or a victory, but that's what it means. The referee was refing the fight, also scoring the fight on his own scorecard. Crazy. So from there, Carmen faced a field of competition of a level previously unseen, and it showed. 20 days after coming out on top against a former world champion, he lost an eight-round unanimous decision in his first performance in New York City. New York City? That was followed New York City. That was followed up by a 10-round draw on April 12th in New Orleans. That was his first appearance outside of New York State, by the way. Mm. He then finished the year with back-to-back scorecard losses in 10-round fights, the latter of which being his first appearance at Madison Square Garden December 15th, 1950. So 1950, rough year for our boy Carmen. Yeah, big venues, though. They're getting bigger. They are. They are. At the time, it was impossible to know. But these setbacks, along with the three defeats and a draw he accumulated by the end of 1952, would be the toughest stretch of his career up until the final fights of his career in 1961. Hmm. On August 20th, 1952, Carmen dropped a 10-round unanimous decision to fellow Hall of Famer Billy Graham at the Chicago Stadium in Chicago. But he went on to win seven straight with three knockouts, culminating this run with a 12-round unanimous decision over Graham June 6, 1953, in front of a hometown crowd of Memorial Stadium in Syracuse. It is here he won his he won the inaugural USA New York State welterweight title. Damn. That next month, he retained the title by fighting to a 12-round referee scorecard uh, draw against Billy Graham. Beat Billy Graham in a unanimous decision. Drew against Billy Graham in a 12-round fight. You don't cha- Titles don't change hands in a draw. You have to beat the champ to be the champ. Yep. Is the Memorial Stadium, and maybe you don't know that, we could always check it out. Is it is it the same? Is it? I wonder if it's the same one that's like the the On Center, the War Memorial. It's, so it's not because they not. go they reference it differently. Gotcha. So I, I I'm not entirely sure where Memorial Stadium is, but perfect segue more than ever. From there, Carmen mm-hmm. went to, cemented his legacy as one of the most outstanding fighters of his time, despite a failed attempt to unify. The National Boxing Association, so from here on out, I'm going to refer to that as the NBA. I don't mean he went and he won an NBA title. 
but the National Boxing Association title, a New York State Athletic Commission title, that's going to be NISAC, and the ring welterweight title. Um, again, he failed to unify him. He lost to Kid Gavilan, which is another Hall of Famer, then a 15-round split decision at the War Memorial in Syracuse. Carmen went on to amass a 19-2-2 record between September 18, 1953, and April 1, 1959. Within that time span, Carmen competed as both a middleweight and a welterweight, and at any given time held, held championships in the NBA, NISAC, and the ring. Wow. So two weight classes, three different belts. He held a combination of those six belts at, in different combinations at different times throughout that time. That is wild. But there was no point in that time frame that he wasn't a two-division champion, aside from, you know, obviously the time it took him to win one and then the other. After that, he was pretty much a two to, a two-way champion until the 60s. That's and again, remember, wild. this is tight. These are tight timelines that he's doing. So middleweight at the time, I believe, was like what we'd call more like a lightweight now. So that would be more like the mid to low 150 range. And then welterweight, which was kind of a catch-all term at that time. I mean, now welterweight, uh, you're looking at um, 175 pounds, I believe it is, under the unified rules, believing me right now. Uh, but it was more like that, the 160, 170 range. So mm -hmm. he's fighting, cutting weight, or gaining weight, or just not at all, and he's staying at the lighter weight and fighting up. They don't, they don't really get too much into that because, it because again, boxing being shady at the time, <laughs> weights weren't super well moderated and regulated and recorded. You just said, mm -hmm. hey, I'm a welterweight or, hey, I'm a middleweight. And as long as you're kind of in that area, it wasn't like we see now with like half-pound weightnesses and stuff. But anyway. Yeah. And you, you said so, real quick, too, not to cycle back too far, but it was, what, 50 – what was the big one, the 55, 1955? For the one, and the only reason I'm saying it because it was around, anyways, in the 50s when we were talking about the the war, um, the war memorial and everything like that. Oh, 1955, yeah. Syracuse, um, their team was actually NBA champions, the Syracuse Nationals. Oh, okay. So 50s, Syracuse, a lot of big things happening. Yeah, I'm things assuming going the down. war memorial. The war memorial was where I believe it was the Syracuse Nationals. Um, like I said, which was an NBA team back in the I day. I think so. it was there. I'm guessing that he probably would have fought in their home stadium. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking so because I was at the Moore Memorial not too long ago, and there's a ton of Syracuse national stuff there. So yeah, so Syracuse doing big things, doing big things. So yeah, during this time, uh, during this time, Carmen escaped the fame he had accumulated in Central New York by moving his training camp and a summer home to the shores of the St. Lawrence River. He set up shop in the small resort town of Alexandria Bay, just under an hour south of where we are recording this show right now. Mm -hmm. While he was there, Carmen embraced the local color and community. He could be seen jogging around town, working out with local clubs, and help coach the local fighters trying to reach the heights which were occupied by, by Basilio himself at that time. His legacy is so cemented in that corner of Jefferson County, New York, that to this day, the annual Carmen Basilio Quest for Champions is hosted by the Watertown Area Boxing Club and their director and head coach, Johnny Pep. Hmm. It, is, uh, it is a night for the Northeast's budding amateur talent to step in and test their mettle. It is often attended by Basilio's loving, living relatives, family, and including his wife, Josephine, whom I had the pleasure of interviewing for a story when I was working for the Watertown Daily Times. I got to cover That's this cool. when I was working for the paper. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. As I'm sure Josephine was sweet. She was. She was an absolute sweetheart. They live in, she lives in, I think she's still alive. She lives in Rochester. Oh, that's cool. Um, it was also during this time, Carmen put forth historic fights against the likes of Sugar Ray Robinson and Johnny Saxton. It took a fighter the caliber of Robinson to permanently halt Carmen's voracious appetite for title belts when, on March 25th, 1958, Robinson came out the victor of a 15-round split decision at Chicago Stadium. Chicago Stadium, not a great place for our boy Carmen. Doesn't Man. really see a lot of success there. A lot of mobster uh, ties in Chicago then, though, right? Just throwing that uh, out there. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I, I don't know what Billy Graham had his hands in. Um, I know there's some stuff pointing around about what Mr. Basilio is doing, but that's not what the story is about. True. Fair. So, uh, 
So, yeah, so he drops this split decision. And, again, to clarify for not boxing nerds, split decision, you have three referees, two refs said uh, the winner won, one ref gave the fight to Carmen. Or, I'm sorry, one uh, judge gave the fight to Carmen. And so with that loss, Carmen lost all at the same time, the NBA, the NISAC, and the ring championships. Yikes. He would never go back. He would never go on to recapture those belts. Man, stupid Chicago. Fucking Chicago with their fancy pizza. And the Bears. And the Bears and Mike Dika. Uh, but yeah, throughout the following four years, Carmen would answer the call to challenge up-and-coming fighters and attempt to reclaim his former belts, but none of these attempts bore fruit. The upstate onion farmer heard his final bell <laughs> April 22nd, 1961 at the Boston Garden when he lost a 15-round unanimous decision to Paul Pender. The fight would have won Carmen his former NISAC and the ring titles. Find it funny that they're competing for the NISAC title at the Boston Gardens, but whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so after post-prize fighting, uh, Carmen didn't stay put for too long. He had, not only was he enjoying the spoils of his boxing career, but he also had a nice pension from the United, from his time spent as the United States Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. Um, taking this, he followed his passions. So late, uh, later on in his career, he and his family had relocated to the Rochester area where he spent some time being a spokesperson and sales representative for the Genesee Brewery. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um, he also was a sales representative and spokesperson for a sausage company, not to be confused with Basilio and Buddha, which is still a sausage company operated in Canastota, New York today. Absolutely delicious. If you have a chance, get it. You got to get the cheddar onion sausage coil. Absolutely delicious. The sweet onion, also delicious. Regardless, though, wrong Basilio, that was his cousin. Hmm. Probably still love onions, though. You're probably still helping the family. Just get them onions. Yeah, yeah. Generational wealth. Yeah, yeah. Um, And then going back to what I was saying about him not being an academic, on nothing but moxie, in professional boxing record alone, he got a physical education de- uh, job at Lemoyne College. <laughs> hey, so, despite, there's a lot of, man, there's a lot of other states besides New York where you can actually go and just start being a teacher, and you don't have to have much of a degree. Apparently, New York was like that. Maybe they yep. should bring it back. Yeah, if you could just beat the shit out of enough people, you could teach. You, you could teach at Lemoyne. You could. And teach he wasn't even class. a Jesuit. They made it a point in my research to mention that he's not a Jesuit. Like they said it like three times in the bit about Lemoyne. Um, But yeah, so despite being a high school dropout, never having gone back to get his high school degree, let alone a college degree, he taught physical education at Lemoyne College for several years. It's funny. But what the Basilio considers his crowning achievement happened in the 1970s. Okay. So this was when he helped coach his nephew, Billy Backus, to a world welterweight championship. He claimed this to be better than winning the belt for himself, and it was this partnership that drew the final attention of Ed Brophy, the man who would go on to build the International Boxing Hall of Fame in Canastota, as he put it, the hometown of two world champions. Hmm. But they never put Bacchus in the Hall of Fame. Really? Yep, he's, he's still... I even looked at the class that's coming up this summer, Billy Bacchus, the Pete Rose of boxing. Not allowed. But not probably the gambling. Well, who knows? It was the 70s. I mean. Fair enough. But he's not. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Again, Billy Backus. I don't mean to slander. I don't know if Billy's still. But we don't know. He's he's, regardless. He's not in the hall. They don't let him in the hall. Not in there. But although Backus has yet to be inducted, Carmen was inducted in the inaugural class of 1990, along with names the likes of Muhammad Ali, Billy Cohn, Joe Frazier, Rocky Marciano, Jose Napoles, and the former foe in Sugar Ray Robinson. Oh, they had to the put them in together, huh? Yep, they put them in together. Uh, there's actually some really cool pictures that I'm going to post on the Instagram of uh, Carmen and Sugar Ray Robinson, like, hanging out on the stage in the 90s. Like, just two old badasses just, you know, just chilling. That's funny. And, and while he's going to be doing that, some of the pictures of the upstate onion farmer – from his post fights are some of the rugged. wildest rugged just beat up ones uh you, you should look forward to to checking those out i love that they just got him a crown and a cape why not 
Like that was just part of his promotion was that I have this crown, I have this cape, I'm Carmen Basilio, fuck you. That's basically what exactly. that was all about. I'm talking I mean, you know what? If if I was let's see, where is it? I have it right here. He should have been if a spokesperson my... for a nail company because he's tougher than nails. Absolutely. Uh the enshrinement, so yeah, so the enshrinement officially set his final professional record at fifty six 16 and 7 with 27 knockouts. Damn. Not too shabby for a first generation Italian American onion picker, considering Muhammad Ali, the considered greatest boxer of all time himself, and a heavyweight, not to mm-hmm. mention. So remember Carmen hanging around that 150, 160, 170 range. Muhammad Ali was a heavyweight north of 200 pounds. Muhammad Ali entered the Hall of Fame at 56 and 5 with 37 knockouts. That's wild. But in the Except end, Carmen, Carmen did it in about 18 months. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah exactly. Actually. And he, he didn't do any movies or anything in the middle of it. No. He just grinded it out in Binghamton. But in the end, despite these being a tenacious pressure and volume fighter, it was his lungs which finally gave out on him. On the morning of November 7th, 2012, the upstate onion farmer passed away, surrounded by family and friends due to complications from pneumonia. He was 85. Damn. I mean, he would be pretty good if he was alive today. But I mean, yeah, over easily. He'd be over 100. No, 1927, I believe he was born. Oh, fair enough. Gotcha. Yeah, he's not going to quit. 27. All right. Who knows? I mean, he might fight Jake Paul. We don't know. That's true. That's true. He's not going to. He would have. Yeah. In closing, the life and times of Carmen are best surmised in his own words. I can't concentrate on golf or bowling. Those bowling pins aren't going to hurt me. I concentrate in the ring because someone is trying to kill me. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, brother. Thanks, everyone. Right. Yeah, yeah. Why don't oh, you tell them uh, sources? sources? Yeah, we can't forget our so, sources. Yeah. All the lovely people that, uh, that that we couldn't come up with all this great information without you. Absolutely not. I'm not that intelligent. So, of course, we have Wikipedia, and I pulled from Carmen's page and from the International Boxing Hall of Fame page. Mm-hmm. Um, I pulled – and then I pulled content from the – both of these are Carmen's uh, obituaries from The Guardian in the U.K. and mm-hmm. from ESPN – excuse me, ESPN.com. Um, and then I also used BoxingBase.com to – get a little bit more of the breakdown on some nitty gritty, like uh, inside baseball type stuff that I wasn't super familiar with that I needed to, to elaborate on. Yeah. No, thanks to all of them. Shout out to them. Make sure you go check them out. Show them some love. That's mm-hmm. all we got. That's uh that's the episode, I believe episode nine, your town podcast. And we're going to come back with episode Dark. 10, 11, 12, 13, hopefully at least all the way up to episode 69. So yeah. thank you everybody. And uh, Zach, that was good. No, that was, that was a good one. The Upstate Onion Farmer. That's a wrap. Ring the final bell. We're out of here, and we'll be back next week. Same time. Ding, 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 ding. That's all I got.